So hi everyone, I'm Victoria again. And today, Laura, Jacob, Peter, and I will be talking about our findings from our cost benefit analysis project on if Wisconsin should adopt an ABLE account program. So I know that we all know what an ABLE account is, but just for the sake of the presentation and getting the full picture of information, I'm just gonna still go through some of the background and the, the details of it. So ABLE accounts were established through the Achieving a Better Life Act, which amended the Internal Revenue Service Code Section 529 to allow individuals with disabilities to establish tax advantage savings accounts. This is similar to the 529 savings accounts that a parent could establish uh, for their child for college savings. Um, this is just particular to individuals with disabilities. Uh, in order to be eligible for an ABLE account, an individual must have a disability diagnosis prior to the age of 26. Uh, these accounts do have a contribution limit annually. It's $15,000. And the total balance limit that you can have in your account at one time is $100,000. Um, ABLE accounts are used as an alternative to special needs trusts. Um, and this does not in impact an individual's eligibility for uh, federal disability benefits, such as supplemental security income or social security disability insurance. And these accounts are federally exempt tax-wise as well. So the legislative history, in December 2014, the ABLE Act was passed by Congress with substantial bipartisan support. Yay. Um, a few months following that achievement and that decision, Wisconsin codified ABLE into state law, but we did not establish our own state-run program at that time. Uh, in 2017, there were some amendments added to the ABLE Act. So those two amendments listed there are the ABLE to Work Act, and that allows for an individual that is not currently participating with an employer's retirement plan to save an additional um, amount into their ABLE account above that threshold. And uh, the ABLE Financial Planning Act that allows up to $15,000 to be transferred from uh, an existing 529 college savings account into an ABLE account without penalty. Um, lastly, the there is an amendment still up for debate uh, to amend the, the ABLE Act, and that's going to be the ABLE Age Adjustment Act. And that would raise the diagnosis age threshold from the age of 26 to 46 years old. Uh, this expanding the eligible population for, for ABLE accounts. And this is just a, a graphic to show that there are currently 42 states uh, as of November 2020 that have established uh, state-run ABLE programs. And the gray states are the ones without state ABLE programs. And as we can see, Wisconsin is unfortunately gray. All right, so let's talk about what ABLE looks like in Wisconsin. Um, in the Executive Budget Act of 2015, Wisconsin codified the ABLE programs in the state law. However, it did not actually establish its own state program uh, and attempts to do so in the following years have failed. So what this means is that while Wisconsin residents can enroll in other states programs to claim Wisconsin state, <coughs> Wisconsin state tax benefits, there is no actual program in the state itself. So here are a uh, here's like a list of demographics in Wisconsin as it pertains to different types of disabilities and their weighted population. Uh, this is um, back, this is data that uh, we found from the Center of Disease Control and it dates to 2018. And we estimate currently that there are about 145,000 eligible Wisconsin residents who could enroll in a, in the ABLE program. However, the current, uh, however, there are currently only about 100 ABLE accounts open in the state of Wisconsin, which means there's a state adoption rate of approximately 0.0001%. So here are the options and alternatives for Wisconsin that we came up with. The first is an advertising campaign. Uh, this would have, this is an advertisement outreach initiative that would promote enrollment in ABLE programs in other states, but would not actually establish a Wisconsin run program itself. Uh, this would bear the lowest amount of administrative costs. Um, then we have uh, another, our other alternative would be for Wisconsin to join the Stable Alliance. So the Stable Alliance is a 12 state run, uh, 12 state consortium of ABLE programs ran by the Ohio State government, who, you know, kind of, uh, who is, you know, creates a program that everyone, that all these different states 
uh, the residents from these states can uh, enroll in the program uh, in Ohio. And then finally, our third alternative is for Wisconsin's Department of Financial Institutions to create and manage an ABLE program for the state of Wisconsin. And here are the, ver the various benefits that we were able to come up with. Um, now we split these into monetized and non-monetized benefits. The monetized benefits are avoided state taxes on contributions and investment earnings and avoided federal taxes on investment earnings. And Laura and Jacob will go into uh, more detail on those later. Uh, but first, Victoria and I are gonna talk about some of the non-monetized benefits, including independent living, increased educational attainment and improved health outcomes. So independent living does not necessarily mean living solely alone necessarily. Uh, independent living can be defined as having the same range of options and same degree of self-determination taken for granted by non-disabled people. Uh, this benefit is possible due to the extensive uses of qualified disability expenses that the ABLE accounts offer a person with disabilities. Um, QDEs can be used um, explicitly for housing related costs. They can be used for rent or utility bills down, down payment on a mortgage. Um, they can also be used for technology to put in your household to help you adapt to living by yourself um, without having to worry about others coming into care for you. So you can use it for, for those expenses as well, but then you can also use uh, QDE funds for um, like paying for a nurse to come in and do in-home uh, healthcare services as well. Um, one of the main benefits of independent living for individuals would be that sense of freedom and control over your own life when looking at past studies. Um, even though they say that it's hard to monetize these benefits, the main response that they get from individuals with disabilities is that independent living offers them that sense of freedom and control over their own lives. Um, in addition to not having to pay for um, the expensive fees for residential care facilities. And the reason that it's very hard to monetize independent living specifically is because of the wide range of uh, disabilities and levels of care that each disability could require and kind of grasping that range um, was fairly difficult. Another one of the non-monetized benefits that we were able to come up with is the benefit of increased educational attainment. Um, able accounts yield an expected benefit from an increase in education and, and that's kind of fairly logical to deduce because you would, you would imagine that uh, a family that's saving uh, money through the ABLE accounts for a child uh, could potentially use some of that money to pay for post-secondary education down the line. Uh, and there is a lot of data out there and we have some data that essentially a bachelor's degree will lead to expect to expect an increase of about $600,000 over in terms of lifetime earnings compared to a high school diploma. And that gives a person greater financial security and flexibility later in life. However, there are several reasons why we can't properly monetize this. Um, one of the reasons is just the fact that there was a lack of uh, literature and data about how about income-based demographics of people with disabilities in Wisconsin. And that's important because you figure there are some demo income brackets where people are more likely to actually save money for their child's education compared to others. Um, and we also have a lack of uh, data regarding the onset age of diagnosis. So a child who is diagnosed with disability when they're say a toddler will give a family much more uh, opportunity and much more time to save money for that child's education through the ABLE program compared to someone who is diagnosed with a disability when they're say in high school. And of course, there is no guarantee that any particular person would even end up attending a post-second or end up getting a post-secondary education degree. And so for those reasons, it's very difficult for us to actually accurately monetize this benefit. So to kind of chart what uses and what benefits uh, an individual could receive if they decided to open an ABLE account uh, in the non-monetized benefit 
realm, we kind of broke down by trying to like specify the categories here. So we broke it up by disability categorized as cognitive, hearing, vision, or mobility, and those who um, are self-care independent living. Uh, those are very specific because of the fact that those are the types of disabilities that require kind of not 24 seven care necessarily, but definitely more like hands-on onset care um, versus the, the other category. So then from there, we broke it down into your possible employment uh, status, so employed versus unemployed, and then we generally assumed that those who would need constant care or to be in a facility would just naturally be unemployed. And then from there on the next branches, um, we have it broken down by your educational attainment level. Because of that, uh, you can use funds for different purposes, like paying tuition if your education level is just high school and you were still looking to continue on, or maybe even a technical certificate. Um, but then you can also use it for other um, other purposes if you're unemployed, like a job training or um, just like a job advisor, career advisor. So those are just some of the ways that we categorized what like very specific groups of individuals could use these funds for and benefit from. Great. Uh, so now we'll detail a little bit about how we actually um, calculated these benefits and costs. And we'll start with the monetized benefits calculations. So again, our two main categories of monetized benefits are avoided state and federal taxes for ABLE account holders and contributors. So Wisconsin allows contributors to ABLE accounts to deduct their annual contribution from their annual gross income and investment income earned on ABLE um, account balances is untaxed at both the state and federal level when dispersed for qualified disability expenditures. For the purposes of our analysis, we assume that all expenditures from ABLE accounts in Wisconsin are used for QEDs and there's no tax penalty um, that um, any of the beneficiaries would um, receive. So like the state benefit, um, investment income earned on ABLE savings are exempt from federal taxes, but there's no deduction uh, for contributions. Instead, there's an annual, um, instead annual contributions made by account holders over the age of 18, may qualify for a savers credit. And so um, the federal benefit calculation differs slightly in that way. So I'll walk through how we calculated our avoided state tax benefits uh, briefly here. So first we calculate the average annual avoided state taxes for an individual by multiplying their annual contribution by their marginal state tax rate added to their annual account balance multiplied by the rate of return and subtracting an asset-based fee from that new balance, um, all multiplied by the state marginal tax rate. Then we find the present value of avoided state taxes by multiplying the annual avoided state taxes by the estimated number of accounts annually and weighting the results by the estimated number of Wisconsin households in each Wisconsin tax bracket. Finally, we use a social discount rate of 3.5% to find the present value across years. We use a similar process to find the avoided federal tax benefits. Again, however, using the savers credit um, versus the, um, the deduction from uh, state taxes. So now we'll talk about the costs. So we monetized uh, two major categories of costs, the administrative costs um, and the loss of state tax revenue and the efficiency costs uh, attendant with that. So we anticipate different administrative costs for each of our alternatives. The Wisconsin ABLE program would require two FTE positions of $100,000 in salary and benefits with an operating budget of $100,000. Meanwhile, we estimated that the stable partnership would require only one FTE position with the same operating budget. And finally, the advertising only option uh, we estimate would require only a modest marketing budget annually of $15,000. We assume these costs across the entire 10 year period that we used in our analysis. So the loss of state tax revenue occurs because the state tax benefit that we previously just discussed is actually a transfer from the state of Wisconsin to individuals in the program. Um, as part of standard cost benefit analysis, we assume that there's an efficiency cost of the state of Wisconsin due to the loss of the state tax revenue and having to raise uh, additional funds through other means. So this is called the marginal excess, excess tax burden, uh, which we estimated from the literature. 
We then multiply the avoided state tax benefit we estimated previously, um, plus uh, by one plus the marginal excess tax, tax burden in order to add that efficiency cost onto the loss of state tax revenue. We apply the same discount rates um, to the present value calculations for these costs. Um, before we go over the results of our, our analysis, I just wanted to talk briefly about sort of what went into our analysis. So because we're doing a cost benefit analysis, we're looking and analyzing these, um, these various alternatives that we looked at from a policy perspective um, based on what net social benefits that they produce. Um, our report goes into much greater detail, but essentially we're looking at net social benefits, which are all of the uh, benefits accrued um, from the program minus all the costs uh, that go into the program. And so essentially we rank order the alternatives um, based on that analysis. And so um, as we go into the results, um, we just wanted to make that clear. And because our monetized analysis is limited to the tax benefits conferred to account holders and contributors um, and does not include those currently non-monetized benefits. We also conducted a break-even analysis by estimating what amount of monetary benefit all currently non-monetized benefits need to be or need um, to amount to in order to produce positive net benefits. And Laura will discuss that in our results in a little bit. Um, we did this because we're very confident that ABLE program beneficiaries would be able to achieve um, these modest um, gains in non-monetized benefits. We were just unable um, currently uh, to monetize those benefits for the purposes of this analysis. And so obviously this is a first analysis. This is a um, initial look at what this program could produce. And so further work could um, hopefully shed some light on, on what the expected um, or estimated benefits from those non-monetized benefit categories we discussed could be. Um, one last thing I want to note before we discuss the results is that we're looking um, at this analysis through the lens of Wisconsin state standing when calculating net benefits and costs. So that means that we're not including costs or benefits to individuals outside of Wisconsin uh, or governments outside of Wisconsin. So just in just the same way that the, the state tax revenue loss is a transfer from the state of Wisconsin to uh, participants in the program, so too would be that loss of federal revenue. But we don't include that in the analysis um, because we're looking at this from the perspective of Wisconsin. And so what are the net social benefits that the state of Wisconsin, all its um, residents and the government itself would experience um, by engaging uh, more fully in this program? Um, and so an important aspect of our uh, analysis was to estimate the number of accounts um, that would be open and are presently open. Um, and we do discuss how we came to these estimates more completely again in our paper, uh, which we can discuss with you uh, during Q&A. Um, but here's a rough estimation of um, what the accounts would look like. And we just wanna briefly talk about why we assume there's um, different growth rates um, in account growth over time um, per each option. And so we assume that the stable partnership option would grow at the current national account growth rate of 16%. And we assume this because stable um, is a large, um, one of the largest consortiums and partnerships of ABLE programs out there. Um, and so it probably is most likely to reflect what the current national growth trends are for accounts. Um, we assume that the advertising only option uh, would grow slower uh, due to a lack of administrative support in Wisconsin um, and the complexities of um, the current policy requiring beneficiaries uh, to go outside of Wisconsin uh, to sign up um, with uh, ABLE programs. And then finally, we assume the Wisconsin ABLE program has a modest um, uptick in the growth rate um, due to increased administrative support, remembering that uh, we anticipate more administrative support for the Wisconsin program. Um, we assume that there would be lower costs uh, to Wisconsin residents uh, because they are no longer um, partnering, um, getting their ABLE benefits uh, through another state's program, which typically have 
differential costs uh, for persons signing up from out of state, uh, as well as um, probably some trust factor that Wisconsin residents would experience um, from knowing that they're signing up with um, the Wisconsin state program itself uh, versus some other uh, consortium or alliance um, or outside partnership. Um, and so again, uh, this growth rate and these accounts numbers uh, are really integral to our analysis. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna walk through our results of this analysis. Um, and it's a series of tables and we'll also show the distribution of our sensitivity analysis and talk a little bit more about that. Um, the results end up being pretty intuitive based off of the background that Jacob gave. Um, and so this first table is just showing the benefits to the individual. So that's the account holder and also anyone that's contributing to the account and realizing those tax benefits. Um, they will be highest for the Wisconsin ABLE program, both in terms of avoided Wisconsin state tax and the federal tax and savers credit, um, just because there are more people that will have open accounts under this alternative. Um, and there will be a lower number of people involved if it's a stable partnership and much lower if it's advertising only due to those growth rates that we talked about. And similarly, we broke down the cost. And so this is the lost Wisconsin state tax revenue, um, the administrative cost, and those are combined for the actual fiscal impact on Wisconsin, which we thought was important to include because that's what's going to be of most interest to legislators if we're talking about actually implementing a program. Um, but then we also did calculate the efficiency cost. So what is the cost of actually raising that tax revenue um, and then combining it all into the total cost? Again, because of the growth rates and um, the number of accounts that would be open under each alternative, the cost will be highest for the Wisconsin ABLE program, slightly lower for the stable partnership um, because it would require, we estimate, one fewer FTE. And then advertising only has much lower administrative costs, but also the lower uptake rate. And so this table just combines the cost and the benefits and shows our present value of net benefits under each alternative. And these numbers are based off of our Monte Carlo sensitivity analysis. We ran 10,000 trials um, and we'll show exactly which parameters we varied and through what ranges um, in a couple slides. But you can see that the means were positive under all three alternatives. Um, it was the lowest for the Wisconsin ABLE program because of those higher administrative costs. Um, and then advertising only having such low administrative costs ended up with a fairly high mean. It's actually the highest, but um, we think it's really important to consider kind of what, what's the actual individual benefit here. Um, and so I believe on the next slide, we show the non-monetized benefits break even point. Um, so we wanted to find out how large would those non-monetized benefits have to be in order for the stable partnership to be just a little bit higher in terms of present value of net benefits than the advertising only option. And so we ran a series of tests within our Monte Carlo analysis where we introduced a variable for that non-monetized individual annual benefit and varied it until we get the results that you see in this table. Um, so we found that if an individual derives at least $360.47 in non-monetized benefits annually, then the stable partnership becomes more beneficial than advertising only. Um, and so that would also apply to the Wisconsin ABLE program, but we focused on the stable partnership for this analysis. Um, and we think that's a really reasonable estimate just because $360 is probably less than a month of rent. You know, it's less than a semester of schooling. And so a lot of those benefits that Victoria and Peter talked about earlier um, add up quickly. And we think that they would exceed $360 fairly rapidly. And so this table shows our uncertainty um, and the parameters that we varied in the Monte Carlo simulation. So everything from the Wisconsin population growth rate to the rate of return on the funds that are invested um, to the initial account balance and the annual contribution, knowing that not every family, not every individual is going to be contributing the same amount every year. Um, we also introduced a variable for expenditures on QDEs, so how much is being saved and how much is actually being spent, and then um, varied the adoption growth rates too. And so we held the stable one constant at 16 and then varied up for the ABLE program and varied the advertising alternative all the way down to just 1% as a minimum. And finally, we varied the marginal excess tax burden for Wisconsin based on a triangular distribution, um, and so 
as Jacob said, that was derived from a proportion relative to the federal marginal excess tax burden. And this table just shows the uh, further breakdown of the Monte Carlo analysis. And so we see the means, those are the same numbers, but we're also showing the standard deviation and our 90% confidence interval. So you can see that some of those results were negative when we ran the trials, but that would mostly occur if people just did not open accounts. And so another thing that's integral to this analysis is just that that advertising only option is incorporated in the other two alternatives as well. So we assume that both under a stable partnership or a Wisconsin program, we are also doing the full advertising program. And we'll just run through these slides really quickly. They uh, show the distributions from the actual results and that red line in the middle shows the zero value. So for the ABLE program, there were a number of results that were below zero, but they're mostly clustered fairly close to the zero. Um, slightly more above zero for the stable program and they're actually all above zero for advertising only because the administrative costs are so low. And I'll hand it back over to Jacob for our final recommendations. Thanks, Laura. So um, after our analysis, uh, we decided to recommend based on the net benefits and our break-even estimate um, that Wisconsin joined the stable partnership uh, due to lower administrative costs. Um, and increased uh, benefits and uptake rate um, for Wisconsin residents. Um, and we believe that this $360 um, uh, estimate for the annual non-monetized benefits um, to be uh, modest and reasonable to achieve. Um, so further analysis uh, could um, show that we're actually severely underestimating the total uh, benefits that might be derived from um, engaging in an ABLE program. So we also want to briefly discuss some of the limitations of our analysis. Uh, one of the major limitations, of course, uh, being the limitations on the data. So estimates of contributions contributed to the number of ABLE accounts currently in Wisconsin and nationwide um, are uh, hard to estimate and find in the literature. Um, the demographic relationships between income brackets, people participating in the program, what their tax burdens are, um, the amount that they would contribute, those relationships are hard to determine as well. The complexity of the tax code also makes it difficult um, to accurately estimate um, precisely where people would fall um, and thus uh, what benefit they would derive from participating in the program. And then again, those non-monetized benefits um, the difficulty in estimating those means that we might be severely underestimating the net benefits to the state of Wisconsin um, if it engaged, uh, or even if, if it just um, drove up the number of ABLE accounts being used in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so that's uh, our presentation, and if you have any questions, we'd love to take them. <laughs>